So you want to make a solar power system. First thing you need is a notebook or a pad of paper. I prefer to use a legal pad or a notebook just so that I can keep track of what I did in the past. We're going to start by thinking about what we're going to be powering with this system. So in my case, I've got a small solar power system that I'm thinking up for my greenhouse. And I really want to give this thing all the bells and whistles. So I'm going to start out by listing that I want to have, let's say, one camera. I'm using a wise cam. version 2. I want to have two small fans. I'm also going to be running a heat pump system, so I'm going to have one pump, 12 volt water pump, And then I also need the heating element that's going to be my backup for this. So, All right. Aside from that, we also have to consider that um, we need to control some of these things. So I'm going to be using a, son a couple of Sonoff, I think they're TH16 switches, two of those to be precise. So two, and they measure temperature and relative humidity, as well as switching. And let's see what else. I'm probably going to need some grow lights in there, as well as a regular light for um, just when I'm going in there, when it's dark out should I need to. So we'll say one set of LED grill lights, and then one strip of white LEDs. Let's see, is there anything else that I want in there on this system? So aside from these things, I'm probably also going to want to give myself some capability for like recharging a camera in there, or doing something of that nature. And so um, I'll probably want a couple of USB outlets, so we'll say two sets USB. Uh, charging outlets. And other than that, um, can't really think of anything else. All right, so then what we get down to is doing a little bit of research on each one of these things. So I happen to know a lot of this stuff off the top of my head, having just done the research for it, but I'll cut over here to showing you exactly how I've done this research online. And um, so it comes down to what the voltages and what the currents are, and therefore what our power consumption is going to look like. So for the WiseCam, um, they recommend that you use their power supply, which is a 5 volt 2.1 amp. The fans are 12 volts, and they're each rated at 0 0.25 amps, or 250 milliamps. Uh, the pump, I've found these pumps usually are about, well, they're always 12 volts, and when running at max load, um, I found them to draw around 3 amps. And you always go for your maximum amount that you could possibly run into. Then my heating element, I just measured the other day, and that sucker can draw an easy 5 amps. 
Um, so we're going to overestimate that one, say 12 volts, and we're going to call that 10 amps just so that we build in enough headroom into the budget. The Sonoff TH16s, um, they're designed to run at 120 volts. Um, in part of this, I'll also show you how I modified one of those to run off of 12 volts DC instead. It's just one component that you need to put in and three that you need to take out. That's it. So um, when they're running in the background, they consume about 120 milliamps, but they can spike when they're first connecting to Wi-Fi. So just to be on the safe side, I'm going to say that I'm running it at 12 volts, and that we'll say it's roughly the same as the fans then, 0.25 amps. Uh, we'll then have a set of LED grill lights. Um, the ones that I have are 12 volt already, and those will normally run at around an amp absolute maximum. That's that's probably even over approximating it. Uh, the strip light LEDs, those are going to be about the same. And then the USB charging outlets, um, maximum for those, usually those give you a 5 volt output, but they take a 12 volt input. So those are going to be 12 volts, and since they can deliver up to about 3, 3.5 amps a piece, um, I'm going to say that we'll carry that number over, even though strictly speaking that's 5 volts that that's rated at. So we're going to carry that number over just to account for the fact that the switching power supply inside is relatively inefficient. So we're going to say 12 volts, 3 amps on those as well. So now what we're doing here is we're sizing the system. And what we do is we take each set of these numbers and we multiply them by one another. So then we get out our watts. It's this old formula. Power equals voltage times current. So 5 times 2.1, well, 5 times 2 is going to be 10 watts. So we're just going to approximate it and say that this is a 10 watt draw. The fans are going to be using up a quarter of an amp each, but we have two of them, so we multiply 12 by 0.5, we get 6 watts for the fans. Pump's going to be 12 times 3, so a little bit on the higher side. Lucky we've only got one of those because that's 36 watts. Our heating element is 120 watts, so that's a bit on the high side. Uh, temperature and relative humidity switches, we've got two of those, so this is going to be just like the fans. This is 6 watts maximum. Remember, these are all maximums, and there's not, nothing saying that all of these things are going to be on at the exact same time. But this is just how we do the math. The LED grow lights, 12 times 1 is easy. That's just going to be 12 watts. 12 watts for the white LEDs as well. And the USB charging outlets, um, 12 times 3 again, we've got 36, and then we have two of them, so we actually have 72 watts invested in these maximum. All right, so this is everything we're going to be running in the greenhouse. Now we got to total up the wattage. So 10, 6, 36, 120. 6, 12, 12, and 72. Didn't think this would come back to haunt you, did it? The calculations that you did back in grade school. All that arithmetic. And that's why we have calculators on our phones. So, 10, plus 6, plus 36, plus 120, plus 6, plus 12, plus 12, 
plus 72. That's going to be everything maxing out at 274 watts. So that's a lot of watts. But there's something that we need to consider here. You see, the system we're going to be dealing with isn't just two solar panels connected directly to all this stuff. Far from it. And like I said before, the duty cycling of all of these different items on our list is going to be less than 100%, meaning that the water pump's not going to be on very long at all. This is just for a heat pump system that I've got going in there. Heating element's going to be on even less. Temperature and relative humidity switches, those are going to be on all the time. In fact, let's go through and just check off everything that's going to be on all the time. So the camera's going to be on all the time. Temperature and relative humidity switches, those are going to be on the f all the time. And USB charging outlets, they're going to be connected to the um, the power system all the time, but they're not going to be drawing that number of watts all the time, so we're going to leave those off for the moment. Um, either that or we could account for their quiescent draw um, when they're not actually in full use by saying that they add another watt. And that's actually probably a gross overestimate. So if we have the solar panels here, then we have a positive and a negative line coming out of those. And that's going to come into our charge controller over here. So then the charge controller has two other sets of outputs and inputs. One of them's over here, and this is a plus and a minus that goes to our battery bank. And then we've got a plus and a minus that come out of here, and which are going to go to our distribution panel. Or, in this case, it's literally true that this is our fuse box. And then from the fuse box, then you have all of your 12 volt bus lines running off, all your pluses and minus to your, your other devices. Um, yeah, so from the fuse box, there is one other box that we're going to have in this system, and that's going to be our, um, what we might call the PDB or power distribution box. And so the PDB is going to have our USB outlets. A regular 12 volt uh, like cigarette lighter slash car power port style outlet, a voltmeter, and a switch to turn it on and off. So the PDB is just generally four little um, cylindrical pieces that go into a box. Um, that are usually used on like marine equipment or well, boats um, or they're sometimes used for RV stuff or in car dashboards. Either way, uh, they're really inexpensive. They're designed to run on a 12 volt system just like all of the rest of this is and that's pretty much all you need. So because of this 274 watt peak draw this doesn't actually inform our solar panels as much as it informs our battery bank because this is the maximum amount of power that we need to get out of the battery bank at one point in time. Similarly, it also informs the design of our charge controller, which one we need to use, because it needs to be capable of sourcing that. Because remember, in order to get to everything that we've got connected to the fuse box, charge from or current from the solar panels and the battery bank both have to pass through the charge controller. So having a charge controller that's capable of handling a minimum, or sorry, 
handling a maximum of 274 watts is going to be key here. Now, usually they come in about 50 to 100 watt uh, increments, and the one that we're going to be using, if I remember correctly, is a 300 watt box, um, which is great for us because we want the rating of the charge controller to be greater than this number, and we want the actual demand from all of our devices at any given point in time to be less than or equal to this number. Right, so that's the whole entirety of the system. The way that we put together is going to be much more on the wiring side, but this is conceptually what we have. Um, there's one other portion to this insofar as sizing of the panels that we'll get to next. coffee time. So, here we have the earth. Dang, this is one sweet earth you might say. Well, hold on. Right, so for every given little bit of space on the earth, you get some amount of insulation, that is to say, the amount of sunlight that comes into it. Obviously, this is not to scale because we have a giant sun over here and a less giant earth over here, and not much space in between them. Technically speaking, this is one astronomical unit, one AU. But what we're concerned with is one square meter down here on the surface of the earth. Or, for those of you still using Imperial, about one yard by one yard, one square yard. See, the thing is that in order to get to us, Sunlight needs to travel about eight minutes through empty space, and then it reaches the hardest part of its journey, coming into our atmosphere over here, and then making its way down to the surface of the Earth. So by the time that we get our so by the time that we get our photons from the sun all the way down to the surface of the Earth we're getting approximately one kilowatt of power per square meter. So this number it gives us an absolute maximum for how much power we can expect to get over a given size of solar panel. And that number, insofar as how much we get out of it, is just going to keep on going down. This is only the absolute maximum, so we'll say this is our power in. And so now we get into calculation of efficiencies. Because we take our power in, and then we have to consider that our solar panels are only going to be between 25 and 35 percent efficient at most. So P in times our efficiency equals P out. So if we've got one kilowatt per square meter, oh, sorry, um, power in divided by area. And this whole thing is also divided by area. So what this comes out to is if we say this is 0.25, so 25% efficiency, then that means for every square meter of solar panels that we have, the maximum recovery that we can have is going to be 250 watts per square meter. And that's in electrical power. So according to what we saw on the last page, 274 watts is what we're after. If we've got 25% efficient panels, we need just over a square meter to make that happen. But here's where we run into another issue, which is that solar panels maybe 25% efficient for the photovoltaic cell itself. But if you look at a solar panel, it's not 100% solar cell. There's a lot of panel to that as well. And then there's also the fact that usually they have glass or plastic or something else on the front of that that's protecting uh, the photovoltaic cells themselves. So the total amount that we get out of here is still going to be a maximum we could get before 
we run into further problems. So the actual air active area of a solar panel, let's say, is only about 80 to 90 percent of its surface area because that's where the actual photovoltaic cells are. Because if you look at a solar panel, what you'll see is you have got your outer frame, then you have your photovoltaics inside of here. We've got pieces of metal that run across them, both on the front and the back, to actually collect the current from the photovoltaics. And then that comes out the back, usually, of most sealed panels, like the ones we'll be using, uh, as two wires, one plus and one minus. The other thing is that chances are that you're not going to be running these panels in the most efficient setup because of the fact that these are going to be giving you more than 12 volts out. Some panels have what's known as open circuit voltage, or OCV, of on the order of around 20 to 24 volts max. So OCV max, let's say equals 24 volts. And then the peak current out uh, from this is not going to be at that voltage. So even if I take 20, uh, if I take a 100 watt panel and I divide it by say, let's make the math easy. We say that our open circuit voltage can get up to 25 volts off that panel. Or more realistically, a lot of them have maybe about 20 volts as their open circuit voltage. So if we say that we take um, an OCV mean of 20 volts and we have a 100 watt panel, then that means we take our uh, voltage here and we divide our wattage by it. So 100 watts divided by 20 volts gives us a maximum output current then, uh, or charging current of 5 amps. There's a problem though, because if we're trying to use 5 amps, then this voltage is going to drop. You see, the thing is, we have what's known as the IV curve. As you demand more current, then the voltage is going to drop. And these are semiconductors, so that means that they do this in a nonlinear fashion. There's a relationship here that doesn't mimic a straight line. So that means that there's what's known as the uh, maximum peak power point. So in this case, where we can get the most current at the highest voltage, let's say, is right here. And this is what our charge controller does. It moves the current demand and it moves the regulation of the voltage to try and steer it to this MPPT, this maximum power point. So this is why we need a charge controller. This is why we need to be concerned about how big our panels are. In this case, I'm using two 100 watt panels for a system that says that it's 274 watts maximum, and yet I'm still not dropping too far. And that's because of the next thing we have to worry about which is actually going to be our batteries. So in this case, we've got two batteries and they're each 12 volts. This is, if you've never seen it, the schematic symbol for a battery. This is the positive side, this is the negative side. The idea is that you have more charge on one side and so it is expressed as current and flows out of there, comes back around to the short side, which has less charge and goes in there. In confusing reality, it actually goes the other way because the electrons come out of the negative side, go around the circuit and go back to the positive side. But that's not what we're getting into right now. Instead, we have two of these batteries and they're wired in parallel with one another. So that means that I've got 12 volts across this whole system because this is a 12 volt battery and so is this one and then I have some capacity to these batteries. Our capacity is measured in amp hours. And so in our case, we have two uh, lead acid gel cells or sealed lead acid SLA batteries.
So each one of these two batteries has a capacity of 35 amp hours. Yes, the new units are coming thick and fast in this design. So each one of these, this means that we have a sum of 70 amp hours that we can possibly use in this battery bank. This is then connected to the charge controller down here and then leads out into the rest of the system. That part's no big deal. The thing is, amp hours just means the amount of charge that you can have sitting in the battery that you can eventually use. So in other words, if I use uh, these batteries and I use them at uh, one amp continuous draw, then I should have 70 hours worth of battery life, in theory. In reality, um, something that happens to batteries, and this may look familiar from the solar panels as well, now in this case it's not current, this is voltage versus time. And what happens in different chemistries of battery is that you have different voltage versus time curves. So if I wanted to use, for example, uh, lithium ion batteries or lithium polymer or lithium iron phosphate, then I'd get a curve that looked like this. And that crashes down here. Um, and this is assuming uh, constant load which means actually constant current draw. So then, and this is lithium chemistry. Down here, on the other hand, this is going to be the curve that we'd see in a lead-acid battery, like an SLA or a gel cell, or even a car battery. And that's much more like this. So we start out around, nominally I think full charge is 13.8 volts for this uh, lead acid battery chemistry. By the way, for the lithium chemistry ones, it would be probably around, uh, let's see, it's usually a multiple of 4.2. So I think that would usually be around, eh, call it 17 volts for the max, but usually there's a regulator on board that brings it down to 12. Either way, sealed lead acid or any other lead acid chemistry batteries, you're starting out around 13.8 volts. And then you get into this linear-ish segment, and this is between about 11.8 and about 13.2 volts. Here, after 11.8, the battery starts to actually be damaged if you draw down below that. And this is also why you can't actually use the entirety of your battery capacity. Because if you reach your cutoff voltage where you start doing ba damage to your battery, then you effectively call the battery dead at this point. And all of this area right here, the rest of this line, that's dead to you. Literally, it, it is a dead battery. So in that case, let's say that this is probably about, call this 80, um, this is going to be, say, maximum 15% of the area underneath this discharge curve. Then that means that we need to derate our batteries by 15%. So if I've got a 70 amp hour battery bank, then I need to say that I'm actually at 85% of that. So, and once again, this is why God made calculators. So 0.85 times 70, 0.85 times 70. So call it about 60 amp hours when we derate it. All right, so that means that I can run one amp continuously for 60 hours. Cool part is that we're still going to have charge coming in from the charge controller, at least during some of the daylight hours. When we get above a certain voltage in the solar panels, we'll be recharging the batteries, while at the same time also powering our load. So, what that means is that as long as we, as long as we take the amount of 
derated battery capacity that we have. So we take 60 amp hours and we say that our common draw, we go all the way back to page one here. So let's say that we had 10 watts and then we had six watts here. We'll round it up and say that we do 20 watts worth of continuous power draw. More round it up even further to make certain that we derate properly and we'll say that we've got 24 watts which means that we need to draw 2 amps continuous. So 60 amp hours is going to then be divided by our number of amps. So we said that that would be 2 amps continuous draw. And so 60 divided by 2 that's going to be 30 hours of battery life that we get out of our 60 amp hour derated battery bank. And this is greater than 24 hours. I can't emphasize this enough. As long as your derated um, capacity for your batteries is greater than one day, greater than one rotation, and therefore one uh, brightening of the skies, then you're still going to be pretty good because that means that unless you have some massive draw event that you don't foresee happening normally uh, for many many hours you're not going to deplete the batteries down to this point we're going to stay somewhere in this range right here let's say for our voltage versus time curve for constant draw so in my case 12 volts 60 amp hours, this battery bank will work perfectly fine for my purposes. And this is where we actually get to start building the thing. Um, at least in our minds, because we need to make a slightly more detailed system diagram than what I did on the first page there. So in our case, we're going to have two solar panels, and I'm going to have them on either side of a greenhouse facing southward at about 45 degrees because I live at 45 degrees north. Literally, like, I am four houses south of the 45th parallel. It's kind of freaky. All right, so this has a pair of wires and their respective connectors coming out of the back of it. This has the same. Now what I need to do in my case is I need to extend these wires over to one side and then I need to put a Y splitter in so that I can join these two panels in parallel. So this let's say is our plus and minus, this is our plus and minus, that means this is our plus, this is our minus. These two wires are going to come into my greenhouse. So we'll show a dividing line right here between outside and inside. Once these get in to the greenhouse, and that's another thing, is that I'm going to want to connect these over here on the outside of the greenhouse in some sort of water resistant, if not waterproof, uh, connector. Once these get inside, then they're going to go to the charge controller. The thing is, the charge controller has screw terminals on the back of it, so I need to put some sort of ferrules on here so that I can make certain that the ends of the wires don't fray. I'll just abbreviate these as PV for photovoltaic. Alright, so now on the sides of the charge controller, the charge controller actually has all of the uh, inputs and outputs on the back of it, and they're all screw terminals. In this case though, I have a little bit of a different sort of charge controller because the load handling is done um, 
kind of more in the traditional method where it's just the batteries that are hooked up and the charge controller is just uh, controlling the charge into the batteries themselves. So, we've got this hooked up to our battery bank over here. And once again, these are going to need ferrules on them to go into the back, into the screw terminals. These are also known sometimes as uh, shoelace terminals uh, because they It's also basically, it's known as a shoelace connector because it's essentially an aglet, uh, the same thing that's seen on the back end, or sorry, on the tip of a shoelace to bind those fibers together. Similarly, these are aglet or shoelace style crimp sleeve ferrules that are going to be crimped onto these wires to go into here. So here's our positive, here's our negative. Now because the charge controller here doesn't actually do the load balancing for us, then that means that my load center, my, um, my fuse box, is going to be connected directly in parallel with the batteries. But the charge controller also has a voltage feedback port, which is going to be coming off of these two wires here. And these round hops, they're literally hops, they just mean that the wires aren't connected to one another. So, here's our voltage feedback. And then this goes to our fuse box. So, our fuse box is a marine style fuse box, uh, which actually uses blade fuses like you'd see on a car. It has a... Um, negative input at the top and a positive input down here at the bottom and then it has in our case there are six circuits so it's got six grounding screws up here and then there are two LEDs per row that show you whether or not the fuse is blown and it can take six blade fuses out on here, two on each row, and then you have your positive terminals for your circuits. All right, so this is our marine fuse box, and I'm going to be connecting each one of these screw terminals, both in the ground strip and also in um, the positive portions next to the fuses themselves to each one of those circuits that I'll be running. So in this case I'm going to be running one of these directly out to that PDB that I was talking about before. And we'll get to PDB wiring a little bit later. And then I'll also be taking one of these grounds and running it out to the PDB as well. Um, for all of these connections, I'm going to be using fork terminals. So I'll put an F next to each one of these that's going to need a fork terminal on it. For the batteries, we're going to be using ring terminals because the batteries have little, um, little eyelets of a sort. They've just got through-hole terminals on the top. So what we'll do is we'll just say... Uh, put R as wherever we'll need a ring terminal. So we'll need ring terminals there. We'll need a ring here and a ring here. And then since these are going to be connecting to the batteries as well, then we'll need ring terminals for each one of those as well. Uh, for our feedback, um, technically speaking, this should be on the fuse box itself. And so these are going to need fork connectors. 
Uh, the reason why we'd use ring versus fork is that each one of these ring connection, uh, ring terminal connections is going to have a screw going through it from the side, uh, which we're going to have to put a nut on the other side of. For the fuse box, on the other hand, the screws are captive. They're actually kept in place, and the, screw po the threaded portion of the screw only comes out uh, to a certain point. And you should generally try and remove, uh, never remove those screws fully from the fuse box. But what we're going to be doing there is we'll be putting the f uh, fork connector in from the side and then screwing down the screw on top of it to clamp it in place. All right, so then other than the PDB, which is, by the way, also going to run the camera, then uh, the temperature and relative humidity switch, we're going to have one of the temperature and relative humidity switches on over here. Oop, that goes over there. I'll just say TH16 because that's the model number of this thing. And we're going to need to have, no, oh, I should probably point out this is negative, this is positive. So we're going to need to have another ground or negative line come up and over here. A series of hops over and then bring that into our TH16. Then the TH16 is going to be switching a couple of fans. Now because of the um, because of the way that the TH16 is connected, uh, we're actually not going to be terminating the wires at all. Uh, we're just going to be kind of rolling the ends of the wires together. Uh, the loose here. The loose conductors on the end of the wire, like this, we'll just be kind of twisting those together and then putting, the, <clears throat> putting those into the terminals on the TH-16 separately. And so we've got a positive and negative line that come out of the bottom here. And these are going to go out to our two fans, which are going to be on opposite sides of the greenhouse. All right. There are more things that we're going to have to go through here, and by the way, from the PDB, I'm just going to draw a line up to the camera. Because that's USB, that's not something we're going to have to really deal with. Um, last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what the internal workings of the PDB look like. So PDB is really simple. It's a plastic box with four pieces um, screwed into it. So each one of those four pieces uh, is basically just a circular or cylindrical piece like these. Um, this one's going to be our 12 volt power, so that's going to basically just look like a car power jack or a cigarette lighter jack. Down here we're going to have a switch. This is a round thumb switch that just has a little blue LED on it because all of the most high-tech stuff needs a blue LED. Um, over here, we're going to have our higher current uh, USB power, and this one is capable of supplying up to 3 amps, So, and is actually wired for USB 3, so we'll call it USB 3, and it also has a voltmeter. So we'll see what the bus voltage is of our 12-volt 12, 12 quote-unquote line. And then this one's just a regular USB 2. Uh, charger where you have, I think it's 2.1 amps max on each one of those. Um, both of these are duplex, meaning that there's two USB sockets per. On the backs of each of these, you have two one quarter inch um, spade terminals. And then on the back of the switch, oddly enough, you have 
two um, three sixteenth spade. Uh, sorry, you've got three three sixteenth spade terminals, and one of those is going to be more of like a brass or gold color, and that's your ground. It's also slightly further away from the other two. So this is going to be our minus or ground, and then one of these is going to be our plus input, and this is going to be our plus out. All right, so plus out gets wired to each one of these in parallel using quarter inch spade lugs. And then ground is ground the world around here. So that's all of our wiring diagram for this, except for the inputs. So the input and the ground are both tied together and we're going to have those come out of our box. So this part's the box and then what we're going to use is what's known as a PG9 cable gland and that will allow us to take two conductor wire, in this case we're using uh, I think it's 14 or 16 notes. 14 gauge speaker wire that we're going to be putting in here and then crimping into uh, the connectors that come through the rest of this. All right, so time to get started with the build. We'll build out the PDB, then we will be building out the rest of the system inside of the greenhouse and uh, connecting the photovoltaic panels to it. So let's get started.